Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 78 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, folks, there will be no spoon. We're going to talk about ankle pinching. Ow! What happens when you got a little pinch after you get an ankle sprain or you get a little pinchy pinch when you go down into a squat? Stay tuned. We're going to talk about ribs or spine. Which one do you want to go after first? Which is the highest priority if your goal is movement variability? Hashtag oil of the CNS. What you going to do about it? Last but not least, we're going to talk about deviated septums and sinuses. How should we go about approaching this type of condition? These are the questions that are on docket tonight, and they are, have been asked from the people, answered for the people by this people right here, fam recognized fam. Before I dive into the debrief, I want to give y'all a little tip that I got today while I was in the clinic. I had this evaluation. It was this woman who had left knee pain. She initially injured it many moons ago. This, I think we're talking in the summer, jumping off of a four by four car, had a little pop, um, no swelling, nothing like that. They ruled out the big bad stuff, got better over the course of two months. Then as the weather kicked into high gear in beautiful Page America, she started experiencing the knee pain again is now utilizing a cane, and this is not an older woman by any means, she's in her upper 40s, utilizing a cane to walk, immense pain, can't straighten, ugh, problems ensue. Interesting though with her is she can't straighten, bending is totally fine. So I'm like, cool, why don't you just stay chilling with your bent knee? So she's sitting, she can bend 9,500, tons, tons of bending. And then I go and get her on her back and I'm going through all my tests and measures. And all of a sudden she's like, oh, I'm experiencing an exorbitant amount of pain. Just like doing this, it's like, no, I'll muscle through it. I'm like, nah, that's not really what we do here. And I said, well, let's try this position on your back, blah, 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 blah. I kept her there and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm like, oh, why is this happening? And I said, hey, you know what? Why don't you just sit up? That might be a little more comfortable. And as soon as she sat up, pain went away. Now, why is that the case? Same amount of bend, different position. What was the difference maker between those two positions? Well, I'm glad you asked. The difference was this woman has sleep apnea and she doesn't have her CPAP yet, is my suspicion. So when I had her lie on her back, typically when you lie someone on their back, and this woman was, was obese, encroachment of the upper airway, can't breathe, that's going to turn the volume, up, volume knob up on a lot of things. You probably want to have some type of cue to get up and move if you're not getting adequate gas exchange. So my thought was, we set her up, wow, that allows her to breathe more effectively, life's good. And we were able to actually do an activity with the same amount of bend, and she had no issues. So something to consider. If you have someone who has sleep apnea and has an exorbitant amount of pain, that's compared to other positions, you may actually choose side lying or sitting or a different position besides supine or hook lying in order to open up the airway. And that may actually mitigate some of the symptoms. And I think maybe, maybe the treatment for this woman in the long term is getting her hooked up with CPAP or some other type of device, which we will talk about in question three. But without further ado, Let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from my home girl, Salida, although I believe she goes by Kaylee as well for people who can't pronounce her name, and I hope I pronounced your name well. So my home girl, Kaylee, or Salida, asks, this took a while for me to think of the biggest question I have at this point. This issue pops up continually from client to client. Pinching in the anterior aspect of the ankle typically after an inversion ankle sprain. What is the deal with that? My question is, what steps do you take after improving infrasternal angle and hip extension? Also, is this a very normal compensatory mechanic resulting from an ankle injury? Slita, Kaylee, whatever you wanna go by, that's a great question. Let's try to answer that for you today. Ankle pit pinching. Let's talk about the mechanism of an inversion ankle sprain first. So if this is the 
talus, this is the mortise, and this is my ankle joint. Due to roll and glide mechanics, if I fall into an inversion ankle sprain, the, uh, the, the mortise, or the, the, ta the talus, I should say, glides anteriorly. When that happens, maybe there is some sensitivity or even injury of some of the structures anteriorly. That can pose a problem. Consider this, though. If I go upstairs to the ventral cavity and something has oriented my center of mass forward, that's going to develop concentric activity of the plantar flexors, which is basically continuing to reinforce that anterior glide. So someone can't shut that off. Maybe someone can't manipulate the ventral cavity in a manner that allows for clearance or a relative posterior glide of the talus. You'd go down into a squat, you go down to do some activity, ow, pinch in the front. No bueno. What do you do for this? I'm glad you asked. The fix, believe it or not, is still ventral cavity management first and foremost. You want to make sure you can get the thoracic diaphragm and the pelvic floor stacked atop one another. Because if you can shift your weight back, what that can do is that might actually reduce concentric orientation of the plantar flexors. That could reduce the amount of anterior gliding that's occurring at the ankle joint. Give you a little bit of space, boom, get you to squat. Especially considering most people, when they squat, cannot get the sacrum to counter-nutate as they drop down into position. So when that happens, and I have someone who's stuck in an anterior orientation, they may, instead of squatting straight down, hinge backwards. This, if I'm trying to squat, well, I'm gonna have a hit end range sooner at the ankle because I can't overcome the concentric activity that's happening at the plantar flexors. I can't get enough space in the pelvis or in the hips for that matter, because if I'm anteriorly oriented, I'm gonna hit end range hip flexion sooner. I try to take up more space at the ankle joint, that area gets overloaded, you got problems, fam. So what you need to do is make sure that's taken care of first, and maybe it's not ISA and hip extension, but maybe it's making sure that you can ensure and maximize sacral counternutation. Activities I like, I'll link them in the show notes. But that has been um, probably the biggest shift for me in my treatment, is instead of emphasizing a lot of hip extension in the beginning, well, I still emphasize hip extension, but going after sacral counternutation has been a big deal. Because if I can counternutate the sacrum, which is also a posterior uh, orientation of the pelvis, as I do this, you can see that the hip is in relative extension. There's no difference between that posterior orientation and me hip extending. So let's take care of the ventral cavity first by getting the posterior orientation and driving something such as a squat. Let's say you've done that and you still got some problems. More often than not, you won't, but let's say you do. Then you would continue to go after other motions you might lack. Maybe that's hip internal rotation. I'll throw some activities that I like for hip IR. Uh, that would be another thing to consider. Also consider this, hip abduction is also a big move to, to look at. I'll attach my favorite study that I've attached a bazillion times on this debrief. But they did a study where they measured glute medius activity after an inversion sprain, and the activity seems to be reduced. If you think about it, if I fall into inversion, my femur is going to fall in a relative amount of adduction. That's going to give me some concentric activity of the adductors. So if I want to undo that, maybe everting the, the, the feet, foot as well as driving hip abduction can rebuild that relationship that is lost after an inversion ankle sprain. Another movement to consider, again, in the show notes, after I'm done uh, debriefing tonight, it will be on the website at zackcouples.com. If you've still done those things, and despite your best efforts, you still got some problems at the ankle, maybe 
and that's probably the only time that I will go that route after I've cleared all this stuff, is doing something locally to the ankle. If you have manual therapy background, doing some type of uh, manipulation works great, like an ankle distraction, doing posterior glides, not just of the talus, but also of the distal tib fib. All of this stuff seems to be incredibly impactful. Um, those are some of the big things that I like. I did a whole post way back when on treating ankle sprains. And while I would say this is probably the most up-to-date thought process right here, a lot of the local treatments that I would employ are in that post. I'll link it in the show notes. You can also consider doing band traction. That will be in the show notes as well in that post. Um, and that's just giving yourself a little bit of traction, performing movements in all directions. And a lot of times just going through that step-by-step -step process of managing the ventral cavity, clearing out the hips, and then going to the ankle ought to take care of pinching in most cases. If you have someone who has maybe had several ankle sprains and they've had some type of adaptation occur locally at the ankle, I had a hooper that I was working with on the Grizzlies who had that. He, uh, he had an ankle surgery, I think he had a bone, something bone removed. And he couldn't get hardly any dorsiflexion. Maybe for someone like that, when you're trying to do some of your activities, your best bet may be to give them a little bit of a heel lift. So that way they don't have to go into extreme dorsiflexion to perform a lot of activities. Think about what your goal is. If your goal is to load the lower body, why not just elevate the heel and have them squat and hinge and do all of those things with that positioning. You're still going to get the loading that you need. You won't, uh, you'll, you'll take advantage of what ankle mobility they have and you will eliminate that pinch more often than not. To summarize that point, if you got pinching in the ankle, ventral cavity management is number one. I like doing a ton of squatting and doing things to encourage sacral counternutation when you are performing that activity. If you've done that, you wanna go after hip internal rotation, hip abduction, those are two big moves as well. And after you've done that, go down to the ankle, do some treatments there, see what you get. If all else fails, just elevate the heel a little bit. Anything where you're having to squat or anything like that, you can still load the lower body despite having this pinch. But if you do those things for ankle pinching, you ought to be in business. It's lit an unbelievable question. The next question comes from Sarah. And Sarah asks, should thoracic extension or rib flare be addressed first. If I bring my ribs down, then I am more kyphotic. If I perform thoracic extension, then my ribs flare. Also, I tend to have my abs turned on all the time because I'm self-conscious about my stomach sticking out. Any pointers on this? Ooh, bonus question. I think this is affecting my upper body. Sarah, great question. Let's dive into this one. First off, with dropping the ribs down, you shouldn't have this substantial thoracic kyphosis from doing that. Because if you just hunch to try to drop the rib cage down, what is happening more, most likely is you are concentrically orienting the rectus abdominis. That is just getting you sternal depression. What it's not doing is getting you a zone of apposition, i.e. bringing the rib cage downward so the diaphragm can maximally ascend. If you want to learn more about that, check out the show notes because I'm going to put that in there, fam. EOA. So we don't want this. What you want is a complete exhalation so I get multi-directional compression of the rib cage. That should encourage lower abdominals kicking in. That should encourage obliques kicking in. And that should give you an appropriate amount of thoracic kyphosis. Because guess what, Sarah? Kyphosis isn't a bad thing. That is a normal curve that we should have in the spine. It becomes an issue, possibly, when I have a hyperkyphosis and I can't get the pump handle mechanism to occur in the anterior chest wall. If you don't know about pump handle, for crying out loud, check out the show notes. These might be the best show notes in the game, fam. I'm telling you, got a lot. Now, I want, therefore, Getting the zone of apposition and getting the ribs first is the prime thing that we want. Because if you just go into thoracic extension, one, 
I highly doubt that you are actually going to get the extension occurring uniformly throughout the upper thorax. If you don't have that anchor of the zone of apposition, you're probably going to hinge somewhere either in the upper lumbar spine or the lower thoracic area to try to get you in that position. No bueno. Because really what I'm trying to teach when I'm trying to either get thoracic extension or thoracic flexion is being able to move air in and out of the posterior thorax. With increase in kyphosis, that is associated with inhalation. When I exhale, the thoracic kyphosis ought to reduce to a degree. If you don't have that rib cage set up in place, you're not going to drive air effectively in and out of the posterior thorax. So you're either going to be too hunchy or you're going to be too flat. And for big Z, neither of those are sexy. Rib cage first. If you are going to drive thoracic extension, you want to make sure that that's anchored. And what I've found best, if thoracic extension is your goal, when would it be your goal? Really the only time I go after that is if I'm really trying to drive terminal pump handle. It's the only time I really think about driving thoracic extension. And a move I like is exhaling, raising the arms up overhead, breathing in that position, or even doing a little bit of a backwards bend while in that position. Um, that will actually maximize anterior chest wall expansion. But you have to have um, pretty much everything taken care of first before you even consider that. I want to make sure that someone can keep the rib cage dropped, someone is able to tuck the hips, maybe get a decent squat. Those are some of the things I'm looking for before I even consider driving that. And really, there's only one person who I have been driving that with, and that's myself, because I've done a lot of those other things, and I still am having a hard time going overhead. So to summarize that part of your question, Sarah, the key is always going to be the rib cage first, and actually the rib cage and pelvis, making sure those are stacked. Because when you have that, you can create that piston effect to drive air in and out of the upper thorax. That is needed before you go driving thoracic extension, if you need it. Rarely will you. All thoracic extension and flexion is about is managing air in the posterior thorax. If you don't have the rib cage anchored, you won't get air in and out of there. If you need thoracic extension, the only time I can see that is if you need to increase anterior chest wall expansion. That could be useful for shoulder flexion, among other things. Then I do like backward bend variations, but that is the probably one of the most terminal activities that you would ever do with someone and it's a very rare occurrence if that part two of your question sarah i'm self-conscious because my stomach is sticking out the problem in terms of why your stomach is probably sticking out has to do with where the the uh, intestines the guts and the goods have to go based on where you are managing gravity within the ventral cavity. If you have an increased lordosis, the guts are going to be more prominent. That's normal. It has to do with how the, the guts move as you breathe in and breathe out. Because inhalation and exhalation is going to move all the internal organs. You have this pong game between the thoracic diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm. And if you don't have space posteriorly, all of the goods and the guts are going to move anteriorly. That's going to give you the appearance of having a larger gut than you probably do. So the fix, guess what, is the same poop that we talked about for thoracic extension. You need to make sure that you can get your thoracic and pelvic diaphragm stacked atop one another. You can perform some of the activities I talked about with uh, the ankle pinching. And if you do those things, you ought to not have as much of a necessity for keeping your abs tight all the time. Because if you're doing that, you're probably not getting as good a gas exchange as you want. You're probably also, to a degree, losing movement options in various areas. But if you can teach yourself to manipulate your body to get into some of the orientations that I've discussed, that ought to reduce. So manage your ventral cavity if you want to minimize that. That's big. Obviously, too, it goes without saying that if you have extra adipose tissue, you may need to do some other interventions to take care of that, but that is talk for another debrief.
Sarah, I appreciate your question so much. Before I dive into this last one, I want to ask you, if you're thinking, Zach's talking about all this ventral cavity management stuff, and you're like, oh man, why is that important? Or how do I get my clients to not pinch when they squat? Or how do I get them moving in multiple directions so we can maximize performance? I got the answers for you, and they are at Human Matrix, because it is coming your way in the following locations. On May 18th and 19th, I'll be in San Antonio, Texas. In June 8th and 9th, I'll be in New York City at Hype Gym. August 3rd and 4th, we'll be at Cincinnati, Ohio. April 24th and 25th, Vancouver, British Columbia. September 21st and 22nd in Raleigh, North Carolina. October 5th and 6th in Boston, Massachusetts. And the last place of the year, December 7th and 8th in Orlando, Florida. So you should check it out. The last question. Whew, this one's a doozy. It's a combo question. Ding, 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 ding. Comes from Mac and Cat. These two ask, um, this one's Cat, I believe. To what degree can sinus issues affect positioning, patterning, orientation. I live in the Midwest, I'm sorry, and the constant weather changes seem to give me constant sinus issues. Along with my sinus issues, I notice my position always feels a little shittier, if you will. Oh, I most certainly will. A little more extension, a little less air getting where it needs to go, blah, blah, blah. Would it be fair to assume when my sinuses get a little wonky, it is affecting the way I pull in air, which would then affect my position, right? I'm gonna answer this first, Yes, it most certainly would. If you can't breathe in through your nose, you have to breathe in and out through your mouth. If you do that, that's going to alter body orientations. You are going to have a better leverage to mouth breathe if you assume a forward head posture. Think about what that would do down the rest of the line. If I have a forward head posture, that's going to alter the curves in the rest of the spine. You may not get air the way you like. You may have certain limitations based on that. Um, typically in this case, what you'll see is a reduction in pump handle, not always, but a reduction in pump handle. You might also see anterior orientation of the pelvis, lots of different stuff. That is going to most certainly impact how you get air in and out. So the solution may be getting some of that stuff taken care of, which goes into the next part of this question, which is from my boy Mac. He's an OG, by the way. Fam, recognize fam. Zach, I've always been a mouth breather, and I have been trying to nasal breathe as of late. I went to see an ENT, and they said I have a moderately deviated septum, as well as blockage from my turbinates. He wants me to try Flonase for a month to see if I get relief, but that he could surgically straighten my septum and reduce the size of my turbinates. What are the disadvantages to these options? If I consciously nasal breathe and tape my mouth overnight, will my structure improve at all? Thanks. This is a great question. I need to preface this question with a little disclaimer. So um, most of the septal work or my knowledge of this stuff comes from my own personal experience, my own journey with trying to maximize some of this stuff, and the journey of some of my colleagues. I haven't recommended this surgery to many clients, or, or going down this line with many clients. And part of that has to do with some of the constraints that I have where I'm working right now. I don't have as, I don't have people who would be willing to go that extra route to get some of these things to change. I see a lot of Medicaid. Most of those people can't afford that type of surgery. So I totally get it. Before you dive into this stuff, you should most certainly maximize and exhaust every conservative option possible. If you decide to go to the ENT route, there's some conditions where I would consider this being a must. This would be if you have sleep apnea, if you have upper airway resistance syndrome, if you don't know what that is, I'll link that in the show notes poor sleep quality, or you have bad allergies. Upper airway resistance. History of stroke. Think anything that where if you're not getting adequate gas exchange, which is just about everything, this might be something to go to. But, but, but think of the big things that would kill you. And like, those are the things that come to mind. Sleep apnea, you can't breathe through your nose, you're not sleeping well, maybe that leads to a stroke. Yeah, we need to talk this route. 
Um, with that in mind, I think that the conservative route that Mac is going is your first line of defense and you most certainly want to do that. I've known a lot of colleagues who will tape their mouth shut and they'll get quite a bit of success and symptom relief from doing that. But there's some people, and I have a friend right now who I'm thinking of, oh, please listen in, um, who tapes his mouth shut and he just rips through the tape and breathes in and out through, through his nose. The only way you're really going to know if you have success with an intervention such as that is tracking sleep. I like the Aura Ring. If you don't know what that is, I'll link that in the show notes. Um, I, uh, sleep study is also something to consider. I would probably do a couple because the first time you do it, ugh, um, it's you know, you're probably not, it's, it's just such a contrived environment that you're in, even if you do the, the home ones, that you probably want multiple rounds to get a legitimate finding on these sleep studies. Um, my buddy Joseph Sinelli, who I'll link in the show notes, and he's way more well-versed in this than I am, um, he likes the watch pat. I'll link that in the show notes as well. That's supposed to be a pretty good home sleep study. If you do that and you try Flonase, you try some treatments to take care of your allergies, they gave me some type of hormesis-based treatment where I would, when I was living in Arizona, they gave me just a few droplets and I would have to take these over and over and over again until I got used to uh, or got developed um, immunity to the allergens I was being exposed to. Those would definitely be the first lines of defense after um, doing some of the stuff that you've already tried, Mac. So I think you are totally appropriate at doing that because surgery has risks. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of stuff done. I've gotten my wisdom teeth out. I've gotten my, my uh, nose cleaned out, my rotor rooted as they call it. Um, I've gotten, uh, obviously, my tongue, uh, the frenuloplasty. I've done all these things, but those are also risky things. You can die from a surgery. So if you don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole and you can get most of the benefits with more conservative measures, I strongly encourage you to do that. I'm just crazy. But also too, I want to do this stuff because in case I ever recommend these treatments to someone, I want to make sure that I have gone through it myself and done due, due, due diligence so I can make the best recommendations possible. If we're talking about surgeries, this is a tough one because I think you need to have some type of trained professional. And I'm not even talking a PT. I'm talking an ENT, a dentist, someone who really hones into upper airway um, to let you know where you need to start first. Because I know people, I'm lucky. When I got my septum uh, deviation fixed and I got the turbinates reduced, which if you do the surgery, you want the reduction. You don't want the turbinates taken out. There's a thing called empty nose syndrome where you, your symptoms will come back because of the anatomical changes. You don't want that. Please try to go for a reduction if you have to go get that surgery. I'll, uh, I'll link the empty nose syndrome in the show notes as well. It's pretty, uh, pretty nasty. Or it's empty nasal. One of those two. Um, but I do know some colleagues who get this done and it doesn't work or it works for a little while and then it starts to come back. Well, why would that be if you have altered the anatomy in a favorable manner in the nose and then all of a sudden you're not breathing as clearly as, as you should? And even to me, to a degree, I, I don't have the clarity that I once did, but it still keeps and bounds better. The problem is because there are other potential influences of the upper airway that could create an obstruction or a restriction. You can't just look at the nose. You have to look at your, your facial development. Do you have a mid-face deficiency where I have a reduction of um, bone growth in the mid-face? There are surgeries you can get for that. A little extreme, but there's pretty good evidence for it if you have obstructive sleep apnea. I'll link uh, one of my favorite meta-analyses in the show notes. For surgery. There's tons of different appliances you can get to advance the maxilla and the mandible forward. All of that increases space in the airway. There's also the surgery that I got, which is the frenuloplasty. I had a tongue tie, got that taken care of. My sleep has drastically improved since I've done that. Not perfect yet, but it's gotten way better. 
Think about this. If you can't place your tongue on the roof of your mouth because of a restriction of the frenulum, well, it doesn't matter if you got the prettiest mid-face in the world and you got the cleanest turbinates in the game, you're still going to mouth breathe because you can't create that sealant on your own. These are all things to consider treating. But in terms of the order or what you need, you probably need a professional to look at you. Because if you do one and you don't do some of the other ones, that treatment that you might have hung your hat on as being the panacea for getting you to breathe through your nose may only work temporarily or not at all. That's where looking at a trained professional comes in. But those are a lot of the options you want to consider. But Mac, I agree with you. I would go the conservative route first. Um, especially, I, you know, I haven't looked at the side effects of long-term Flonase use, but it would be something I would consider checking into. And if you can get by with just taping your mouth shut, I know some people who do that and they do pretty well. Also, the Breathe Right strips work pretty well also. But I would do that first. I would also maximize a lot of the stuff that I do in terms of proving, improving movement options. All of this stuff is airway. You can impact the, air, the upper airway by altering neck orientation. Maybe that's enough, but you don't know unless you've gone through all of those steps. Because while I think doing a lot of the upper airway stuff is incredibly powerful and impactful, you probably don't get the success that you would if you haven't done lower airway based activities along with it. Unless we're just talking about pure anatomy in order to help you sleep or to improve the airway. I would take care of that first. If you take care of that and you're still having some issues, and the big issues I would say is you still have continual allergies, you're still mouth breathing, you're not sleeping well, then maybe you want to go a little bit more drastic route. I would get evaluated though by someone who knows what they're doing, and that's probably either an ENT or a dentist or a highly trained physical therapist like my buddy Joe. That's who I go to, because, uh, and that's who I would refer people to. Um, those people know way more about this stuff than I do for now. Stay tuned. But it's not just getting the turbinates reduced or getting the septum fixed. You have to look at that. You have to look at the structure of your face. You have to look at the palate. You have to look at your tongue function. All of these things contribute to how the upper airway works and how much gas exchange you can get there. And if you have a fault in any one of those areas, you may not have the most successful outcome that you could get. If you do those things though, you will likely get a favorable outcome, but just make sure you cover all your bases before you go dive into any one hole. And I think that's a good stopping point for us tonight. Great questions, people. I wanna thank you all for tuning in. You've been beautiful, sexy, and outstanding people tonight. If you wanna learn more about me, go to zackcouples.com. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter. It's right at the top. You, you will get uh, four and a half hours of me talking about pain and breathing. You'll get a free acute to chronic workload calculator. You'll get goodies from me every Friday. Lots of good stuff. Definitely check me out there. I also offer three services. If you are getting ankle pinching and you can't find the right move to make that better, if you want some guidance in terms of going down the pathway I just talked to you about, I can be your guy and we can do a movement consultation. What we'll do is I will take you through my assessment we will find out where you can't move. We'll restore those movement options and hopefully get you back to business. Once you've done that, and maybe you want to take it to the next level, you want to get gains or your post rehab, you're unsure how to start the loading process. I can write a program for you that is fitness oriented, taking that information that I got from the movement consultation and tailoring it specifically to your needs with your goals in mind. Or maybe you want to learn how to do that with your people. You want to get your client's goals to the next level. That's where the mentorship program comes in. We will discuss what holes are in your game that are impacting your ability to meet your client's needs. We will have that struggle uh, and working together trying to get you there. I'll take you through coaching some of this stuff. Whatever it is we need to help you reach your goals, I can be your guy. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, you'll want to also go to the Zach Couple Show on iTunes and Stitcher. Because guess what, folks? There's 77 other debriefs. Do you really want to look at me? Especially the early years when I didn't have the beard. You definitely want to sign up for me on there, take me on a long car ride, and also leave a review so we can help the fam grow. Other places you can find me, I'm on Facebook, forward slash Z Couples. The Twitter handle is at Z Couples. I'm also on the Instagram, baby. Zach, Z-A-C, couple C-U-P-P-L-E-S. And last but not least, 
You can also find me on YouTube. If you want to see what exercises I'm using with my clients as of right now, you probably want to go to YouTube and search that couples. Thank you all for tuning in. You've been a beautiful audience. I hope you keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.